How's it going, everybody? Andrew Zarian here, Wrestling Observer Live. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, and Sundays, 6 p.m. Eastern. We're here on a Sunday. It's a Sunday edition. Man, you know what? I always look forward to this show every week uh, it, for a number of reasons. Obviously, I love doing it, but mainly, uh, I get to summarize the week in wrestling, which I don't get to do with any of the other shows that I do. It's always about, you know, what's happening in the moment, and I really... I got a thing on the fly a little bit, and sometimes I put my foot in my mouth, but I like the weekly roundup with the rumors and the new stuff. Uh, our producer, Matt, does a great job of putting the notes together. Man, we got a lot of news coming out, especially out of today. AEW DDT announced a work agreement. This is going to lead me down a path of, of some, uh, some assumptions on my side and some fill in the blank. We're going to play a game here. With everybody, because uh, I spoke to a couple people at WWE a few weeks ago, and it's interestingly enough that the night of the Ring of Honor announcement, I was told that AEW was working on an agreement with an international pro wrestling promotion. We'll go into this, obviously. Gable Stevenson defended his NCAA championship for the sec uh, second year. He competed in this. Uh, obviously, he did great this year, and now he is WWE bound. Hung up his boots, left it in the ring. Or on the mat, I should say. Cody's reportedly already signed with WWE. That's the uh, big story here. It's finally coming out that it's, it's, it's happened. It hasn't happened. I believe it's happened. I'm going to go with the confirmation that it has happened. He is signed with WWE. And we'll go into all the possible scenarios here. WrestleMania card is also shaping up. You know what? This card does not look bad at all. Yeah, it's two nights. Yeah, it's like 4,000 matches. It's going to be a total combined watched hour of like 48 hours straight of wrestling. But, you know, it's not looking bad. And also, we got a great guest, a podcasting OG, a pro wrestling podcasting OG, Will Washington from Grap City Podcast over at Fightful. He's going to be joining me. I got to tell you, uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation with him because there's so many moving parts happening in pro wrestling right now. We're going to come back and talk about Cody Rhodes, possibly... Already signing with WWE. Andrew Zarian here, Sunday edition Wrestling Observer Live. We'll be back right after this. Wrestling Observer Live. Andrew Zarian here. I can feel it. I'm feeling it today. I'm pumped. Ten cups of coffee. My kid's knocking on the door while <laughs> we're getting ready for the show. It's a total chaotic scene here. But joining me today, uh, listen, a dude that I have tremendous respect for, admiration for, an OG in the world of Professional wrestling podcasting, Will Washington joining me. Everybody, what's going on, Will? Thank you for having me, Andrew. I'm so excited to be here. Finally, I've been, you know, it's funny. I, I, as long as I've been podcasting, I've also been, uh, I guess, observing the Wrestling Observer. I'm a observing. subscriber to the Wrestling Observer, right? And so it's, it's uh, kind of a full circle moment for me to be here on the show today. Dude, uh, absolutely love it. You, you're doing some great stuff. The Grab City Podcast over at Fightful. Uh, I mean, you've done you've done podcasts for so long, but the Grab City Podcast. I, uh, how long ago did you start it? Because you've been doing a tremendous job uh, with it. I I like listening to it. It's it's early on Saturdays, which I love. <laughs> I know I love getting my podcasting because I, I late night podcasted for 16 years, and to have launched Grab City as a Saturday morning show, and to have the rest of my days. Uh, is definitely different, and my wife really appreciates yeah, that. Yeah, mine too. Um, Grapsity, <laughs> my, my we too. started <laughs> we started Grapsity, uh about six months ago, uh, so it hasn't been that long. Uh, but before that, I had been hosting uh, podcasts for over 16 years, and uh, I did RBR Weekly Wrestling Talk for 16 years, and then um, beyond that, I hosted other shows in between. I did Now Playing Now for many years as well, so I've been podcasting since podcasting was a word i love it and uh it, it's pretty much ingrained in me i've i'm 34 right so like when i say i've been podcasting 17 years that means i've spent the majority of my life doing so which is just insane i love it I, i'm 38 so kind of the same same generation of pro wrestling and this kind of goes right into uh some bad news that i didn't talk about at the top of the top of the hour when we started but uh scott hall passing away uh we got confirmation during monday night raw that uh, he had passed away. It, it's it's such a sad story. The more details you hear about this, the sadder it gets. Uh, he had fallen uh, a few days prior 
and uh, to getting surgery. He ended up having to get hip surgery. He, he broke his hip and he fell and he was apparently stuck like that for a number of days. And, and that's a story that's coming out. And uh, it was so bad that people couldn't get in touch with him. He couldn't reach a phone. And Diamond Dallas Page actually showed up at his house and fa- found him on the floor. Uh, I believe Sean Waltman, uh, X-Pac, put out a, um, uh, I don't know if it was a quote of him uh, of him talking about it or, or an actual post, but he said that Scott you know, wasn't doing too great the last couple of years. The pandemic, uh, I believe the exact words were, did him in. He had lost a lot of weight. Uh, he was drinking again. There were some issues. But what a, I, I, my heart breaks at, about this because, you know, growing up, that was... Like, Scott Hall was a major part of my childhood. Like, that whole Razor Ramon thing, I connected with that character for some some reason. My father loved it. You know, we would do the whole Chico thing, and he would always, you know, it, it was just, it's one of that, it's one of those moments where you stand back and you're like, you know, the pop culture references, you know, the 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 impact he's made on pop culture over the last 20, 30 years, it's unbelievable. And, and uh, you know, I'm, it really bothered me. More than I thought it would, you know, it affected me. How did you feel about this? Well, because you know, we're, we're listen. You're 34. I'm 38. We grew up with the same generation of wrestling, and, and this is a big blow. Yeah, I I grew up with uh, Scott Hall, and um, you know, especially thinking about Razor Ramon and uh, and how you know a lot of people uh, like to say. I said this on Grapsity yesterday, but uh, one of the things that people have said about Scott Hall for many years is that he's one of the greatest wrestlers to have never won a world championship. But what made Scott Hall so cool was the fact that you could tell that didn't bother him at all. Like that's how cool Scott Hall was. And, uh, for me, you know, he affected so much of my wrestling fandom in that, um, you know, not just from the Razor Ramon side of things, which you just talked about, but from the WCW side of things, the fact that uh, when he jumped on that Nitro, that's still one of the most uh, iconic moments I could ever recall watching yeah. wrestling as a kid. Um, seeing him all of a sudden uh, not Razor Ramon anymore. It's like, you know, the, and that first statement he makes of the, uh, you know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. That line like was so iconic because literally everybody watching that knew who he was, did not know why he was here, did not know why this guy is standing here in denim all of a sudden. Um, And the fact that even that deep into his career, he was able to reinvent himself again. Because, like, Razor Ramon was not the start of his career, right? And that was a reinvention. And then he comes in, reinvents himself again as Scott Hall. No, that affected me huge because, uh, you know, when you think about the NWO... Uh, and what the NWO did for professional wrestling and how much it changed the perception of pro wrestling in the 90s and how cool it made pro wrestling Um, and how, you know, Hogan was the the big force in what um, cemented the NWO and Kevin Nash was obviously a a major piece, especially as the NWO broke apart. But like the starting piece of the NWO is Scott Hall and the NWO does not have that cool factor without Scott Hall behind it. And so, uh, nah, he, that's a tremendous loss. And that's one Jeez. that, um, yeah, I, it, it had affected me pretty much all day Monday, just thinking about, uh, because we hadn't gotten confirmation until raw, but we had heard, you know, Sunday night that, um, you know, they were taking them off life support. So pretty much Terrible. all day Monday, I just spent the day, uh, just thinking about, you know, him, his family and everybody he's affected in pro wrestling. Pretty much everybody has a, a story to tell about how Scott Hall guided them or, you know, just he would take the time to talk to young wrestlers and uh, and give them that little uh, just piece, you know, just a little bit of wrestling wisdom that he carried with him. Yeah. Pretty and, much and all the what years. A, what a book. I mean, he he was uh, uh, wrestling brilliant. You know, if you if you look at it that way, you know, and also the transition at that time period. And I always say the reason wrestling was hot. Uh, you know, MTV, that whole MTV generation, the whole, you know, uh, extreme, everything was extreme, everything was in your face, but also, you know, hip hop culture was blowing up at that time. I mean, it was top, every top billboard chart had a rap song in it, which was unheard of 10 years ago, 10 years prior to that. And they played into that. They had that crossover, that cool crossover that was happening. And that's why there was such a pop culture icon still to this day, man. People walk around with NWO shirts. People walk around with Razor Ramon shirts. The influence on pop culture, mainstream uh, or not, is extremely impactful from that era of wrestling. Still, we're seeing it yeah, 20, 30 years later. Yeah, you know, you, as far as... Um, because I think people who weren't 
around or alive at that point or weren't paying enough or weren't paying attention at that point um really missed the gravity of how mainstream things like the nwo like truly were like um you know thinking about uh, the crossover stuff with carl malone and uh and dennis rodman, rodman. and yeah and, and like how much it appeared on the tonight show like everybody knew the nwo everybody knew um what was happening in pro wrestling at that point and cool. even the yeah as uh as casual of a viewer as you were even if you weren't watching or following pro wrestling you knew it and i feel like people knew scott hall i had people uh calling me who haven't watched wrestling in 20 years who are like wait did i just hear razor ramon died yeah. um did i just hear yeah. scott hall died like that was a name that meant a lot to a lot of people yeah tremendous uh you know obviously our thoughts go out to the family and, and uh, obviously all his close friends because uh, devastating news. But I wanted to take a minute and talk about it because I didn't get a chance to talk about it on the show last week because it was Sunday. Uh, some other stuff, and then I'm gonna we're going to go into the Cody story after the break because it's going to take us some time to kind of dissect and, and better understand, you know, what's going on here uh, and, and what his future plans in the company could be because there's so much going on. But I wanted to talk about this. Gable Steepson. Coming to WWE, it's happening. Uh, it's happening sooner than a lot of people thought. He defended his NCAA championship uh, the other day. He left his his wrestling shoes in the in the, on the mat in the ring, and this was his send off coming in. Do they have another Kurt Angle on their hands? What do you think? Uh, if not another Kurt Angle, then maybe another Brock Lesnar. Maybe um, another Brock. Yeah. And yeah, you know, because uh, I was thinking about the way Kurt was brought in. Uh, versus the way Brock was brought in. And I don't know, uh, personality-wise, what Gable brings to the table. But uh, Let's I go to a break. I, Let's go to a break. But I want to get your thoughts on this. Wrestling Observer Live. Andrew Zarian here, joined by Will Washington. We'll be right back after this. Wrestling Observer Live. Andrew Zarian here, Sunday edition. Joined by Will Washington. Grap City Podcast. Before the break, we were talking about Gable Steveson. And, uh, you know, what what the plan with him moving forward is, I think they had got a, they got a star. Uh, it's all a matter of how they play it out, huh? Yeah, I, I wonder how exactly he gets brought in. Um, because, again, we, we do have kind of two formulas for this, as we were talking about before the break. Um, whether we can follow a, a more Kurt Angle type formula where um, his personality is really what defines who he is uh or they do the brock thing because I, I i feel like he'll debut in more of a brock fashion and that he's brought in after wrestlemania uh and uh as far as he's concerned you know do we just come in and, and showcase who he is intensely or um yeah. you know we were talking about during the break you know the guy's got a personality uh and he's very charming um is that the Gable Stevenson we see on TV, or do we bring him in as more of a, a serious, intense wrestler? I don't I, know. I, um, you, you described it way better. The way that I put it is, he he's got a likable face. Yes. I see him and I go, "What a great smile on that guy!" I don't want to boo him. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's how I see it. You know. Uh, but you never know, man. I, I I'm hope I'm very hopeful that he does great. I and and this, you know, the success of Gable Stevenson will set the overall tone of the success of their new uh new program of how they're recruiting talent and looking for oh, yeah, you know, line, colleg yeah. yeah uh collegiate athletes rather than you know going to independent shows and finding the best independent talent very interested to see this S since we're on the debut topic here uh a couple days ago mike johnson i believe confirmed that or, or he reported i should say pw insider reported that the deal was done with WWE a couple of weeks ago, Dave uh, had mentioned a, a couple times that Cody versus Seth Rollins was still scheduled for WrestleMania. Fightful Select is reporting that he's scheduled for the night after WrestleMania. Uh, I don't. I, I think those are both uh, both coinciding with each other. You know, I I got a bunch of messages from people saying like, "Hey, what's the latest on this? What do you know?" And I nothing has ever changed with what I was told about the Cody deal. You know, four weeks ago or three weeks ago, whenever the initial story happened, uh, I was told he was coming. It was happening. They were working on the deal. When the story broke that, I believe it was a Friday that uh, a story broke a couple of weeks ago that said that, you know, things were had fallen apart in the deal. When I reached out to a contact at WWE, I was told, and I quote, no truth. 
to that. So, you know, it seems like the deal is done. He's coming in. Now, the big question is, how does he come in? What does he do? Obviously, Seth Rollins is the opponent, but how does a, how does WWE handle him? And, and this is why I'm saying this is important. I, I'm, I, I'm, I would love to get your opinion on this. But... You have a guy, you have an opportunity for WWE. This is the first major acquisition. Actually, it could be the first acquisition from AEW on a a scale like this. This is the first one. This is setting the precedence on talent that's unhappy at AEW or will be unhappy because it will happen. Right now, we're still in the honeymoon phase. This is a three-year-old company. People are very much behind the movement and, and, and everything. You know, when I spoke to WWE... When the Cody story started happening, they were waving their victory flag saying, you know, this is a great morale boost to the company. We always hear the negativity. We always hear about guys that are unhappy. They want to leave. They don't want to do it there. They go to AW. They want to go somewhere else. But you don't ever hear about guys leaving companies because they're miserable and going to WWE. That's not something that's happened over the last couple of years. I I would maybe think Karrion Cross was one with Impact going to NXT. But other than that, I really uh, guys in the chat, tell me I, I can't think of anybody. But this is going to set an example for AEW talent that maybe thinks they could do better at WWE, on, but it all depends on how Cody is handled. Are they going to throw a title on him for no reason? No, I don't think that's happening. But I do think they're going to be very careful on how they position this guy and what they do with him, at least for the next six months. What do you think, Will? Uh, I think he is in an incredible position to, yeah, set the tone for what is to come for uh, future AEW contracts that are going to expire in the near future. Um, And yeah, people who may be looking elsewhere, you know, there's all the talk that people joke all the time about MJF. He mentions all the time in 2024. Um, This is what essentially could lay the groundwork for that. And it is not just anybody, right? This isn't, uh, you know, some upper echelon guy or even a, a lower guy. This is for a lot of people in AEW, the guy. Uh, and so um, I, I've heard some things about, because uh, you know, I, I've, I've asked around as far as uh, what people in AEW have heard and what people in WWE have heard. And, um, and some things have been interesting because, uh, you know, around the time I heard that the, the talks had, or when that article dropped that the, the talks had slowed down, um, the thing I got in response to that was uh, the same thing you had got, which was uh, not only is there not necessarily any truth to that, um, the at least a lot of people are working, were working under the assumption that nothing was ever going to happen with Cody as far as debuting was concerned, as long as the Go Big Show was on. And that show ended a week ago. Yeah. So... Uh, as far as that was concerned, uh, I'm not sure on whose end that was on, if that was like a contractual obligation or if it was just kind of like a good faith kind of thing. But at least the understanding I was under the impression of was that nothing was ever going to happen there. So for people who have been waiting and waiting and waiting and wondering why he hasn't debuted yet, that's at least what I had heard. Yeah, no, um, I, I had heard I, similar things. I even had heard that he wouldn't want to debut in Jacksonville. But I, obviously, that a lot of that is speculation. Rumors that... We can't figure out. Now, here's the thing, right? Um, I don't know how WWE is going to handle him. I hope for his sake and for for people watching our sake, you know, we have to sit through and watch it. They do something great with him. Um, What is what is the likelihood that that happens in your opinion? Do you think this is a this is a moment where WWE really thinks, you know, the the optics of this? Because that's a word that I constantly hear from them is that the optics of what, what we're doing. And I tend to use that a lot now, too, because it makes a lot of sense. It's it's perception and it's optics over anything else. Do you think that they're going to be able to uh, do right by Cody? In order to do right by Cody, I would have to know what Cody's after. I had That's a tweet a earlier question. about yeah. this um, because, uh, you know, thinking about the identity that Cody has crafted since 2016, you know, he... Uh, He's known for his promos. He's known for kind of being a little bit outrageous in his matches, um, going a little bit over the top. You know, he did the shovel thing in the match with Malachi back in October. uh, And, you know, talking about bleeding in pro wrestling, I don't think anybody's bled in AEW more than Cody. Um, The guy had, the guy did color in a match with uh, with Jungle Boy that (laughs) that was literally announced like the week before. Uh, But, 
So when I think about Cody and all the things that have kind of defined Cody over the last six years, almost none of that would fly in WWE. And so I almost wonder if the plan is to do maybe like a CM Punk type thing where like that's exactly what you're going for. You know, when you think about CM Punk in 2011, where he was kind of positioned as a character against the system, they actually allowed him to do a lot of those things that the traditional WWE superstar wasn't able to do. And what that did was that actually rallied a lot of the hardcore fans behind CM Punk as an anti WWE uh, figure. And if, you were to do that with Cody Rhodes because I've kind of been paying attention to his tweets a little bit. You notice he, even in like the last three days, he tweeted AEW fans are the best fans. And like thinking about if he's been signed for like two weeks and he's still tweeting stuff like that, that's kind of interesting. And I almost wonder if that's something by design to kind of help be that kind of character that is an anti WWE figure, but inside of WWE. I don't know um, if that's how they're trying to position him. I, I can't see Cody. I mean, I guess I can because I've seen it before, but I can't see this Cody standing in the middle of a WWE ring talking about, um, I love the WWE universe. Welcome to Monday Night Raw. Like, that doesn't sound like who Cody's been for six yeah, years. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing, right? I, I Listen, people people evolve. People could adapt. Uh, I Listen, you want me to play it out? I'm going to play it out here before, uh, before anything else, before we go to break. And I want to get your thoughts on this. He debuts uh, tomorrow, let's say, right? Tomorrow he debuts on Monday. They set up the Seth Rollins match. He beats Seth, right? He comes out, who's next, whatever. There's a segment in the back, and it's Cody and Vince. And Cody says, I'm coming for your title. And Vince is like, no, but you got to go through somebody first, and it's Austin Theory. And then he says, you got to go through another person. And guess what? It's And there's the Vince McMahon match. It's not going to be McAfee and Vince. It's going to be Cody and Vince. That's the Cody main event. Vince, okay. They're going to they're run a four-month program, okay? Every night, town after town, Vince McMahon and Cody Rhodes, right? Isn't that, isn't that a possibility? <laughs> Absolutely. That, that's actually where I was thinking. I was Perfect. like, See, I know I it's it. going to be Vince versus Cody in I some it. way. I, I wasn't it. thinking of match, but honestly, <laughs> I could absolutely see no, them I could going Vince see versus Cody. Yeah, I can yeah. definitely see them going down that route. Listen, I, you know, this is all exciting stuff, right? Obviously, I'm half joking here, but I do think they're going to probably end up with Vince somehow. Uh, another thing they could play into is the fact that he maybe he left because he contractually he can never get a title. And the most important thing in this business is a world championship. And he's here to get a world championship. Maybe he could play into that. I, listen, there's a lot that they could do. I'm not going to dump on this yet. Uh, I want to give it a chance. Because I can't imagine he left this pretty comfortable job, right? This this very comfortable job that he was in. He had a job for life as long as he could possibly go. Uh, he wanted more. That's, that's what it really comes down to. He wanted more than he had. And WWE was able to give, I guess, lead him and, and give him what he wanted. Or, or, you know what's or really going to set the tone? I, I'm going to ask you. Which do you think he comes out to, Smoke and Mirrors or Kingdom? Because I feel like that's going to set the tone I, for... I think Smoke and Mirrors. But I think Kingdom. You think Kingdom? All right. You know I what? Let's so. do a... He owns it. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll put a stipulation on this. Wrestling Observer Live, Andrew Zarin here with Will Washington. Coming right back after this. Wrestling Observer Live, Andrew Zarin here, joined by Will Washington. Listen, the, the we're, when we go on break, we're doing like a whole separate show. Will and I, yeah. we're having these best conversations about, you know, about everything. We're all over the place here. Uh, we spoke about Cody, obviously. Uh, we're going to find out, man. Now, I don't know if he's showing up on Monday. I would I would imagine they want they need to give it some time and build this program. They're in Chicago for week, so. Monday, right? They are in Chicago. So pretty good venue to do something, you know, in Chicago. Hot crowd, I'm imagining. it. At the end of the day, I'm watching Monday Night Raw live. For the second week in a row in a long time. I haven't done live in a long time. I just watched the next day. So this is stuff's moving on. Stuff's happening. We'll find out. Uh, big story that came out today. AEW and DDT have a working relationship. Chris Daniels, which is a VP of talent relations. A lot of people didn't know that. I, I was surprised by, by the amount of comments from people. Uh, Chris Daniels made an announcement uh, as part of the DDT 25th anniversary. It's wild that this company's been around for 25 years. Uh, DDT talent will be brought in to work AEW shows. Now, this is where things get interesting because this goes back to a couple weeks ago when someone at WWE, the day of the Ring of Honor announcement, 
called me and he was like, hey, listen, uh, today's the day. I'm like, okay, what's what's happening? He goes, I'm pretty sure it could still be Ring of Honor, but I'm pretty confident that they're talking to a international pro wrestling company for some sort of agreement. And I was like, okay, like what? He goes, well, I think it's going to involve a tape library. And this kind of coincides with the streaming deal that they're working on. They're trying to figure out. So I was like, okay, you know what? This kind of is falling into place here. Now, the question is why DDT, right? And, and I want to get your opinion on this. Why DDT? Before you give me that, and I want to let everybody know, Cyber Agent is the company that owns DDT, Noah, uh, Gan Pro, and Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling. And it's under the banner of CyberFight. They have a streaming platform for their content also. But what happens here and why? Why are you going after, you know, why do you want to work with them over other companies? Uh, you know, notable AEW talent that's worked in these companies. It's Michael Nakazawa, obviously, Thunder Rosa, Rio, and, and Kenny Omega. We all know his connection with DDT. So this is very interesting. I personally believe that my source is correct. If there is this deal happening, we found out the international promotion is, uh, you know, uh, DDT. Does this lead to a tape library? And does this bring us one step closer to figuring out what that streaming deal is? Well, I know I unloaded a ton of stuff here, but I want to get your opinion on this. Wh what happens with this? That is uh, a great question, because I feel like um, this relationship, you know, it, it was announced um, at the time when Chris Daniels did the video that it was going to be the uh, a relationship with DDT. But um, then, of course, Michael Nakazawa later clarified that it is everybody under the umbrella. So it's also going to include Tokyo Joshi Pro, um, which Hikaru Shida just worked uh, uh, two nights ago. And, of course, um, Yuka Sakazaki is there. And um, pretty much a, a good number of AEW Joshi talent um, works out of Tokyo Joshi Pro. And so... Um, there is benefit to the relationship um, as far as that's concerned. Now, yeah, we talk about having a video library. Of course, uh, those are kind of tied in with um, the Wrestle Universe platform, right? And um, I actually watch stuff out of Wrestle Universe. I do feel like that's a pretty straightforward platform for streaming wrestling content. And if AEW doesn't have like a really big deal in the works in terms of like, you know, an HBO Max or something along those lines um, and just needs a streaming type of platform. Uh, you know, I, I would actually like to see them at least from a technological and functional standpoint. I would like to see them kind of pull what Wrestle Universe is doing uh, and... Uh, build that functionality and it's got pretty much everything you could need as far as a streaming service is concerned and it's really easy to navigate uh that's that's kind of what i would like to see um as far as what we get out of that because like we saw Takeshi to come over uh from ddt last year uh he came in he worked the house always wins and then he worked uh those couple of episodes of uh of aw dark elevation uh as far as what that actually brings to like the dynamite fold i don't actually uh know if they could actually bring them in. i don't i don't think it'll do uh, and this listen I, I could be wrong on this and i and i follow as much wrestling as possible sometimes i miss some stuff i get what ddt does uh i don't you know it's it's a different product it's a very different product compared to what people expect out of a traditional japanese pro wrestling promotion uh, they're not a traditional pro wrestler, uh, Japanese pro wrestling promotion. They do things a little bit differently. Noah's Noah being affiliated with uh, the parent company kind of gets me thinking a little bit more. But as far as talent coming in, I think it's always great to have talent. I don't think it's going to affect ratings. But to me, it's this is the the assessed value stuff that I'm into for AEW. This adds another layer of value to your company. You are attempting to come up with some sort of streaming partner uh, that you desperately need. And, and not in a bad way. You do need this because you don't know what's happening with Ring of Honor. Uh, Tony said that he's going to continue shows with Ring of Honor. And they're running uh, the pay-per-view as is. They're not going to be on Sinclair, as far as I understand. I can't imagine that they're going to continue. No, Tony Sinclair. said that uh, specifically during the media scrum at Revolution that... Uh, he was planning on leveraging the current relationships 
uh, that AEW has with Warner Media. So yeah. I don't know exactly what that means, but to me, that sounded like uh, not planning on running anything with Sinclair Broadcasting. Yeah. Uh, listen, you you have a platform that people are very much enjoying with HBO Max. Now, the, the Discovery merger, maybe that's playing a part. I know that they were working heavy on incorporating some infrastructure changes to the way that HBO Max is done because it's going to be, you know, it's essentially all the streaming platforms, Discovery Plus and that. It's going to end up in one umbrella eventually. So you need to incorporate live content. You need to incorporate pay-per-views. This is a perfect, I mean, you put Ring of Honor on, on HBO Max. It's first run programming over there. Now you have the archive stuff of Noah and I'm 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 assuming, right? Noah, DDT, uh, Tokyo, uh, Joshi Pro. You have all these variables now coming in the mix on top of your three years of content with AEW Dark and Dark Elevation and the pay-per-views. It's looking valuable now, you know, when you look at this and you have well, you have Ring of Honor, you have this, you have that. And you're like, okay, what else are they going to add? What else can they bring to our platform? This is, you know, this is, a lot of this is business sense stuff, which I love. And nobody else cares about. But we are seeing something interesting getting built here. And if they're able to do it with HBO Max, I think that's what they need to aim for. We know that Tony doesn't really do little stuff. And that's that's the thing about Ring of Honor also. Do you think they're going to run Ring of Honor as if it's Ring of Honor, or do you think it's going to become more like a feeder system, like an NXT-type product for AEW? Um, well, again, thinking about just what Tony Khan has said, uh, it sounds to me like uh, kind of a hybrid of both. You know, he kind of used NXT 2.0 as his example of uh, what, why he was going to be the booker for Ring of Honor that he kind of, he seemed to imply, and of course this is just me picking out his words, uh, because using NXT 2.0 as the example, he had said that, you know, that was transformed as a more suitable feeder system for what Raw and SmackDown, uh, what feeds their bottom line. And he seemed to be kind of implying that he wants Ring of Honor to feed AEW's bottom line. And so I do think it is going to be more of a developmental system. But at the same time, it's also going to be run independently. The thing is, um, uh, the the big, you know, talking about the business side of things, uh, the, the big difference between Ring of Honor and AEW is that uh, Tony Khan owns Ring of Honor. That was yeah. his purchase. You know, uh, AEW has... Um, uh, its ownership is is a little more cloudy because it's actually owned by by Shad Khan and the the trademarks yeah. were actually registered to the Jacksonville Jaguars and there's all of that but like Tony Khan purchased Ring of Honor like that is his uh and so that's it Tony um, Khan it, to Ring of Honor he's done with AEW uh, yes. going right to, he got his father <laughs> took the rug right under him <laughs> You heard it here first. The consortium, <laughs> you know, come out like Ric Flair. The consortium didn't. It's me, you know, do the whole thing. And now there you go. Another great fantasy booking by Andrew Zarian here. Yes. <laughs> terrible. Fan... <laughs> Let me just say another terrible fantasy booking by Andrew Zarian here. No, I, I think it's 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 very interesting. Um, now, now the question is with TV rights deals. We know that WWE at the time when they acquired WCW, could not put WCW on any other non-Viacom station. Will that play a part with this deal? Because AEW is on a Turner property, obviously. He's Warner Media Group. Will Warner Media Group allow Tony Khan to have a pro wrestling product on another channel? Even though it's not AEW, it's still his. There's a lot of this that's going on here, right? There's a lot of moving parts. I'm going to tell you one great piece of advice. Not you. The world. I'm going to put this out there. No matter how independent you think you are, you still have somebody to answer to. And that's the people paying you. And those are the advertisers. That's your TV partner. That's, you know, these there are all these other variables that come into play. Will Will Time Warner want uh, or, or, or be okay with him doing this on another platform? I don't know about that. And that's why I'm hoping that this continues, this HBO Max thing happens. Yeah, I, I want to see... You know, honestly, uh, as a fan, I want to see it be HBO Max simply because um, it's it's in, uh, an incredibly large platform. Um, and there's, I, I believe, of the streaming platforms, aren't they the third biggest, I want to say? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I can actually verify that, uh, but I think I saw that yesterday. 
But just thinking about how big of a platform HBO Max is and how much exposure that could be as far as live content is concerned, I know that a thing people want because it's been uh, eight years. I can't believe I had to look at a calendar for that, but it's been eight years of the WWE Network and people are kind of used to the idea that um, you just subscribe $9.99 a month and that's your pay-per-view. Um, I genuinely don't think we're going to see that. I think that... Um, I, I, I've, I've heard a lot uh, out of AEW that they're really pleased with the attach rate um, that is coming with pay-per-view buys right now that we're looking at, you know, uh, Dave reported uh, in the Observer this past week um, that Revolution did somewhere between, uh, I think, upwards of like 167 thousand buys. I, th I think um, it was like overall the estimate is 167, but I think it was like a six million dollar pay-per-view. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and thinking about... You know, that's the second largest uh, AEW pay-per-view right behind All Out. And uh, thinking about the percentage of the viewership that's buying the pay-per-views is, is huge for pro wrestling. Like, I don't think uh, from a percentage standpoint, any wrestling company in really history has pulled um, that large of a percentage of their base purchasing the pay-per-views. And I think that uh there's a lot of that they're going to want to hang on to and so uh if they end up in an hbo max scenario i think we're still looking at pay-per-view and so that's that's one thing uh, that... same thing uh, i i would say uh, all the conversations i've had with people at warner media not necessarily mm -hmm. uh AEW, i don't think they want to give up that br live or wherever they go right because they, they're a partner br live is warner media they're making a, a lot of money from these pay-per-views when pay-per-views are now showing uh, that people are willing to buy pay-per-views. Those Jake Paul pay-per-views are doing phenomenal. Uh, you, you're seeing a lot of boxing. Box Heavyweight boxing is back with tremendous pay-per-views. Uh, we are now in a different model. And when you tell people, listen, once every couple months, you got to pay 50 bucks versus once every month, you got to pay 50 bucks. I think they'll be okay with paying it every yeah. couple months. Wrestling Observer Live, we're going to be coming back, wrapping up the show. Andrew Zarin here, Sports Byline USA. Final few minutes of Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition. I'm Andrew Zarian. Of course, I'm joined by Will Washington. Join me today. Dude, I had a blast hanging out with you and talking wrestling. Of course. This, I was, had a blast. this is a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I, I definitely want to do it again. But where before, I, I have a couple of things I want to add at the end of the show. But where can people find you? Because obviously, you're doing the Grab City podcast over at Fightful. Uh, start a couple months ago, but what else are you up to? Uh, yeah, so um, on Fightful, I do a couple of shows. Uh, I, on Thursdays, host Day After Dynamite. That's over at Fightful Overbooked, youtube.com slash Fightful Overbooked. On Twitter, I'm William RBR. On Instagram, also William RBR. I'm pretty consistent with that name. Uh, but yeah, Grapsity is my home. Uh, and I'm there every Saturday with uh, Righteous Reg and Phil Lindsay, and that's Saturdays, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. That's YouTube.com slash Fightful. No, fantastic stuff, man. And and I caught you guys, I think, when you first started, and I really enjoyed it. I came in the chat, and I turned it on. You know, it's a Saturday morning. I'm, I'm doing my thing, and I'm like, I got to clean it's up my office. I just turn it on, and I love it. I love the easiness of a, of a morning show. It's so much fun, and yeah, honestly... Uh, especially it being the thing that I, I wake up and do on Saturday mornings. I, I have a blast doing it. It's so much fun. Grap City, Saturdays. Love it, love it, love it. Guys, that's it for this week. Wrestling Observer Live. I'm going to be back next Sunday with another awesome guest. Brian, I'll see you guys tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern. Wrestling Observer Live, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>